actually, on reflection, what I'm really talking about is whether secular non-natural persons can have consciousness, because <clears throat> obviously churches are, are in a different position. The genesis of this was that in December 2014, I posted a note on the blog about the tax case, Exmoor Coast Boat Cruisers, and someone took me to task for not mentioning Hobby Lobby. To which the answer was, well, it was a case note, guys, and the judgment didn't mention Hobby Lobby, so why should I? Anyway, I thought about it a bit, and this is a kind of canter through some recent case law, mainly on tax, you'd be pleased to hear, in an attempt to grapple with the issue of whether secular, non-natural persons can be held to have a conscience or not. The first reference that I could find is a case called Kostanus and Finland, and it was before the European Commission of Human Rights, not the court, in 1997. The Freethinker Publishing Company, which was a limited company, had to pay church tax, and it claimed that this breached its, its Article 9 rights because None of its members were members of either of the two Finnish state churches to whom the tax was payable. And the Commission ruled the claim inadmissible because it said, a limited liability company, given the fact that it concerns a, not a profit making corporate body, can neither enjoy nor rely on the rights referred to in Article 9. It conceded that it wouldn't entirely exclude the possibility that the association was in principle capable of possessing and exercising Article 9 rights, but it concluded that the claim was merely, it said merely, about the company's obligation, not the association's, to pay the church tax. And because for the purposes of domestic Finnish law, the company was a corporate body with limited liability, it couldn't, as a company, plead Article 9. The issue came up in the UK in 2013 in a case called Blackburn. And Blackburn slightly predates Hobby Lobby. <coughs> the Blackburns were husband and wife. They were beekeepers in Cornwall and they traded as a partnership. And they registered voluntarily for VAT. <coughs> they registered voluntarily because it meant that being registered, they could reclaim VAT on supplies made to them in the course of business. Things like jars, printing, stuff like that. But they were also Seventh-day Seventh Adventists, and they felt that as Seventh-day Adventists, they should shun computers, the internet, television, and mobile phones, though they did use a fixed line one, because they reckoned they were corrupting influences. So they claimed the exemption from filing electronically under the VAT regulations, and they were refused. HMRC said that the regulations were very precise, and they weren't intended, quote, to broaden the basis of exemption to include constructions of scripture which fall outside the tenets of a definable faith. On appeal, they conceded that the Seventh-day Adventists, as a church, didn't have an objection to electronic communications. In fact, if you look on the internet, you'll see they've got their own website. But they argued that on a personal basis, their faith required them to live in accordance with the Bible. And Mr. Blackburn cited several biblical texts which supported his view on this. They didn't have any difficulty with their suppliers using computers, but they preferred not to use them themselves, or they, and they wouldn't ask someone to use one on their behalf. In short, they said that to be righteous, they had to act in accordance with their conscience, consciences, and that's what their consciences dictated. Not surprisingly, HMRC argued in return that given the position of the church, the Blackburn's choice was a personal one and they clearly had no principled objection to electronic communications. Well, Tribunal Judge Mosdale allowed the appeal. 
As it happens, Section 6 of the Human Rights Act 1998, which requires public authorities to act in accordance with convention rights, applied because the regulations under which they were operating was secondary legislation unconstrained by primary legislation. So the normal system didn't apply. And on the test in Ouida, where an act has to be intimately linked to one's religion or belief in accordance in order to count as a manifestation, but didn't have to be mandated by it, they qualified. So on that basis, the judge was satisfied that the Blackburns were acting in accordance with their religion as they perceived it. She also dismissed the suggestion that they could get round this by deregistering for VAT, because recovery of income tax was a fundamental right under EU law, and they shouldn't be required to suffer the financial consequences of giving up that right in order to abide by the religious beliefs. But crucially for this discussion, what she didn't address was whether the partnership itself, as a partnership, had rights as opposed to the two partners individually. It appears that she simply assumed that the partners of the partnership couldn't, in reality, be realistically separated. Then came Ho Hobby Lobby, which Malaya was going to discuss, but alas, she's not here. I'll still, however, deal with it fairly briefly. It was about three closely held companies in the States, and they were run by families that held sincere religious beliefs, in particular, the belief that human life begins at conception. And they objected on religious and moral grounds to having to cover certain contraceptive provision for their female employees under what's come to be known as Obamacare. Religious organisations such as churches and non-profit organisations with religious objects were exempt. But the US government argued that the three appellants couldn't themselves claim exemption because they were secular for-profit corporations. Their owners might have objections personally, but the corporations couldn't have those objections as corporations. Well, by a five to four majority, the US Supreme Court held that the regulation provided violated the provisions of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act 1993 because Congress had included corporations within the RFRA's definition of persons. And the majority's reasoning in brief was that a corporation is, quote, simply a form of organisation used by human beings to achieve desired ends. And protecting the free exercise rights of corporations like Hobby Lobby protects the religious liberty of the humans who own and control those companies. Which is interesting. <clears throat> Ruth Bader Ginsburg dissented, and her dissent, I think, is worth quoting at some length, because in, in effect, she accused the majority of just muddled thinking. She said this. The First Amendment's free exercise protections shelter churches and other non-profit religion-based organisations. No such solicitude is traditional for commercial organisations. The reason why is hardly obscure. Religious organisations exist to foster the interest of persons subscribing to the same religious faith. Not so for for-profit organisations. Workers who sustain the operations of those corporations commonly are not drawn from one religious community. Indeed, by law, no religion-based criterion can restrict the workforce of for-profit corporations. The distinction between a community made up of believers in the same religion and one embracing persons of diverse beliefs, clear as it is, constantly escapes the court's attention which I'll come back to. Then back to the UK, after Hobby Lobby, there was Exmo and Coast Boat Cruises Limited, in which the owner and sole director, Mr Oxen, had applied for a religious exemption from filing his VAT returns, and HMRC had refused his request. 
They'd refused the request because its officials weren't satisfied that Mr Oxenham didn't and wouldn't use a computer. He advertised his business on the internet. And because he hadn't demonstrated that he was a member of a religious society with beliefs incompatible with the use of computers anyway. His religious affiliation was rather doubtful. He kind of claimed to be a member of the Plymouth Brethren, but the tribunal judge, Molesdale again, wasn't convinced. So Judge Molesdale rejected his appeal to Article 9. And as to the claim under the VAT regulations, she concluded that first, the appellant did not have beliefs as it was a company, and second, even if its director's beliefs were the beliefs to which the legislation referred, he was not a practicing member of a religious society or order whose beliefs were incompatible <coughs> with the use of electronic communications. Very much in line with the majority opinion in Hobby Lobby, however, she didn't accept that there were no circumstances in which a commercial company could have human rights. Her view was this. A company has human rights if and to the extent it is the outer ego of a person or potentially a group of people. Therefore, it must be seen as being in the shoes of that person and must possess the same human rights because any other decision would deny that person his human rights. Therefore, while it is ludicrous to suggest a company has a religion or a private or family life, nevertheless, a company which is the alter ego of a person can be a victim of a breach of Article 9 if, were it not so protected, that person's human rights would be breached. But on the facts, she concluded that Mr. Oxen was words and he didn't qualify. He advertised on the internet, he got agents to file on his behalf, so require him, requiring him to file his VAT returns as well didn't seem to affect his manifest religious or other beliefs, and she dismissed the appeal. <coughs> then came Ash's page, well, which has already been talked about quite a lot, so I won't rehearse it again except to say this. Like District Judge Brown in the first instance, the Lord Chief Justice, Sir Declan Morgan, pointed out almost in passing, because it didn't prove necessary to explore the point further, that Asher's Baking was a limited company and that, quote, it does not have any religious object objectives in its memorandum and articles of association. Although it is common cause that its name derives from a passage in the Bible, Genesis 49 20, bread from Asher should be rich and he shall yield royal dainties. Whether a limited company could plead Article 9 wasn't explored further. The county court had undertaken a painstaking analysis to establish whether <coughs> the limitations on the MacArthur's Article 9 rights were prescribed by law, aimed at a legitimate objective and necessary in a democratic society, and had concluded that they'd fulfilled the Article 9 2 criteria. So it's clear to me at any rate that if the Lord Chief wasn't going to privilege the consciences of individuals, he certainly wasn't going to bother with the possibility that a non-natural person could be said to have a conscience. But my reference to the company, but my inference from his reference to the company's memorandum and articles was that had it been necessary to do so, he'd have been inclined to concentrate on the conscientious objections of Mr. and Mrs. MacArthur rather than those of Asher's Baking corporately. So, can a secular corporation be said to have a conscience? In 1982, a couple of American academics, Kenneth Goodpaster and John Matthews, published an article in the Harvard Business Review, which has been much quoted since, and they suggested that it was improper, or at best value-free, for organisations to the assertion that for organisations to conduct themselves in conformity with the ordinary principles of morality wasn't just wrong, it was counterproductive. They said that suggesting that corporations didn't have morals was 
tremendous barrier to the, de to the development of business, ethic, business ethics, both as a field of inquiry and as a practical force in management decision making. And people seem to have gone further. Jason Giuliano suggests that from a US perspective, corporations possess beliefs that are truly their own. They are dis they're distinct entities with distinct intentional states. And he argues that not-for-profit corporations, though not, it should be said, commercial ones, qualify for the protection of the free exercise clause. Rex Adler wrote an article fairly recently in which he suggested that there are some companies who pursue moral and religious objectives in tandem with profit making. This is hardly a novel observation. And he quoted Pope John Paul II in Centesimus Atlas, who described a business firm like this. A community of persons who in various ways are endeavouring to satisfy their basic needs and who perform a particular group at the service of the whole society. A profit is a regulator of the life of a business, but it is not the only one. Other human and moral factors must also be considered which, in the long term, are at least equally important. I'm not sure I buy that. Is a business firm necessarily a community of persons? And even if it is, is such a community necessarily a particular group at the service of the whole of society? I'd have thought, in fact, that even some quite large companies were pretty niche in their clientele. And human factors are undoubtedly important for some circumstances like attracting customers and recruiting and keeping your personnel but are moral factors equally important? Honestly I doubt it. It may be reasonable to impute a moral sense to the directors of a closely held company or a small partnership where as tribunal judge Mosdale observed in Exmoor boat cruisers the non-natural person is the outer ego of the person or potentially a group of people. But when you come to a large secular corporation, can it be said to be the outer ego of the shareholders? Many of them, in any case, are going to be investment funds, other corporates, whatever. It's all, in my view, much more doubtful. Big public limited companies may well consist in part of persons at least in terms of the directors and their employees. But whether they're a community is, to my mind at least, a much more open question. And whether they have a moral purpose is even more doubtful. And, you know, look what's been going on recently, all those banking scandals. So, to return to Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dissent in Hobby Lobby, could her distinction between religious organisations and for profit corporations simply be too blunt in the UK context, or for that matter in the US one? My reading of the recent cases is that Blackburn and Exeter boat, boat crews have suggested that UK VAT law, at any rate, is moving towards recognising some religious rights in small businesses in their corporate capacity, even though taken together. The two judgments seem rather contradictory. In terms of the outcome, same regulations, same judge, similar claims, opposite results. The reason for the difference, in my view, is that claims of this nature are highly fact sensitive. The Blackburns could demonstrate that they were serious about it, uh, Mr. Oxen couldn't. But, and it's a very big but, in both cases, the tribunal is prepared to look beyond the corporate form to the beliefs of the individual owners. So perhaps what this is telling us, perhaps, is that the courts are evolving some kind of hierarchy. The answer would be yes for a partnership or a small closely held limited company, possibly, or there again, possibly not for a medium sized business, almost certainly a big fat no for BP or Tesco. And then there's Ashes Baking, which is in the news again, because on the 1st of May, the Belfast Telegraph reported a rather similar 
incident to the one which is currently making its way to the Supreme Court. And it will be interesting to see what the Supreme Court finally makes of Asher's baking. But I suspect that one issue which they might find themselves addressing is the question with which I started. Can a secular, non-natural person have a conscience for the purposes of the exemption? Thank you.